Hello and welcome to our Artist Tax Talk, presented by the P Pittsburgh Glass Center. I'm going to turn it over to Jim Sharvin, our CPA, to continue the lecture. I don't have to get my stuff to anybody. You know, so um, we're, we're trying to, uh, um, you know, get through this and, and, and it, it does help a little bit to uh, have some extra time. So we'll go from there. Um, what we're going to cover in, in this, we're going to talk a little bit about entity selection because um, a lot of you are probably, uh, um, some of you I know have, have incorporated, other people are just kind of flying as a Schedule C. Um, and uh, we're going to find out how to, how to correctly calculate your business profits, whether you're a Schedule C or a, a corporation. Um, there's some special rules out there for artists that uh, you want to make sure that we uh, highlight. And um, COVID in taxes, right? Well, we had death in taxes. Well, the last couple of years, we've had COVID in taxes. So um, then I'm going to help you um, with some specifics on when and where and how to file some online resources. And then John will moderate this Q&A session for us. So we'll start out here with the entity selection. So. Um, you know, you can either incorporate or go solo, right? So why would you want to incorporate, right? Um, so the, the answers are liability, 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 and D, C above. Because the, the reason you want to incorporate is to limit the liability of um, somebody suing you for any number of reasons and you losing everything you have. And, and that might be because, you know, John did a big installation in, in, in somewhere outside of Pittsburgh in this big house, right? And he put this, this giant sculpture um, a, a framework and then all the, the glass globes on there. And that thing probably weighed, you know, um, 1,500 pounds or more. And if that thing, and th these, these people had a, a lot of their, their, their very... Uh, philanthropic. They were going to have this new area where they had lots of uh, entertaining. Well, if, if that structure were to fall on those people, and three of the people were CEOs of major companies, um, then John is going to forever be not um, able to buy me a Father's Day present or Christmas present. So, um, because all of his money from forever would have gone to paying a lawsuit uh, damages. So, um, that's why we do this. So I'm going to harp on this. It's liability, liability. Okay. That's just like location, location is what you want for, um, for a, a retail space. So you've got several options here, right? We got a sole proprietor and a sole proprietor files a schedule C. It just means that you're doing whatever you do. And you could have done this, um, as a, a, a as even a teenager, if you were cutting a lot of grass, um, you, you may have had a business where you made a couple thousand dollars. Well, you would have filed a Schedule C a long time ago. But if you have any, if you're a maker at all, um, if you have any kind of, of, of side business, what people do is they file a Schedule C. But when you file a Schedule C, you have zero liability protection. You mess up, they can sue you and take everything you own. They can take your car, your house, whatever. And John will say, well, but I don't have a very nice car. Well, they'll take it anyway because they'll turn it into $500 and, 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 and keep going. So the next thing you can do is pretty much the same thing as A. You can be a single member limited liability corporation, an LLC. An LLC is kind of the hot thing that, um, that in the last 10 years have, have, have really helped lots of people um, avoid a lot of um, unwanted legal liability. So you still stay, you're the only one. You file a Schedule C, it's called a federally disregarded entity. So it looks just like the sole proprietor that filed a Schedule C. It's the same schedule and all it has is your name, LLC or whatever the name of your business is. But yet it protects you from the legal intrusions. And what it means is you're only liable for what you have in your company. So if you've got $2,000 worth of equipment and supplies and that's it, and somebody sues you, that's the most you can lose. 
Now I say that, two of my other sons are attorneys and they would say, time out dad, no, you could do something that caused additional harm that, that some attorney could kind of carve out. But for overall in general, that's what a filing a LLC as a single member um, LLC does for you. You can be a partnership, but you can't be a partnership by yourself like you can a single member LLC. A partnership is, is you know, if John and Dana want to form a partnership, okay, they form this partnership, they have partnership agreement, etc. Then what happens is um, somebody can leave, but once you're down to just one partner, the partner dissolves, partnership dissolves. And it's um, the, the liability in a partnership, there are several kinds of partnerships. There's a general partnership, and that means you're still legally liable for everything that happens. It's no different than A. It's just that now you have two people to share or three or four people to share whatever the lawsuit says your damages are. You can be a, um, a limited, uh, uh, you can be a, um, um, a, a partnership that has um, limited liability partners in it, and then they're only liable for what they invest in the, in the partnership. So if somebody puts up three grand into that partnership and then the partnership gets sued, the most they can come after that partner is for the $3,000 that they have into the company. So now D is a multiple member LLC. So it's like a partnership that has limited liability and it's incorporated in your state. And so that allows everybody to sort of um, share in that liability. And an S corporation and C corporation, the last two down here, those are a lot more formal. And uh, an S corporation, it's, it, you know, I know somebody had a question before about if you're an S corp, well, there's a lot more work involved. And if you're gonna do that, you have to keep track of, you know, minutes, you have to have, um, you know, periodic meetings, you have to vote on stuff and it, it takes more, there's more legal fees involved in that. There are companies out there online that will do a lot of that stuff for you and feed it to you when it's needed. But it's extra cost. There's an extra um, entity of it's an S corporation files its own tax return. And then it sends out K1s out to the uh, individual um, shareholders, just like a multiple member LLC would send out a K-1, which is just a form that says, this is your share, what you have to report on your tax return. A C corporation, on the other hand, is the most restrictive of everything. But it also has like, it, it lives in perpetuity. It'll stay there forever as long as there are shareholders. And it will go on, but it gets taxed, income gets taxed twice. It's, it gets caught in there. You won't find many artists being a C corporation because if it makes money and you pay money out to the shareholders, they get taxed as a dividend and all that money already got taxed by the government inside the C corporation. So again, of all these selections, right? Probably the one that a lot of you would want to do would be B, a limited liability corporation that's a single member. If two of you want to get together, like if Dana and John did it, well, they could, what they could do is form their, each of them form their own single member LLC. So that way they don't have to go through the expense of having um, a separate entity, you know, and file all those taxes. It can be all done inside your, your Schedule C. Um, but since I do John's taxes, it would mean just more work for me. So, <laughs> all right, let's move on. So again, um, you'll see these these little thing. I have this uh, this resource I use for a lot of my students and clients and stuff when they get confused. It's called Napkin Finance, and it's napkinfinance.com. Literally, they have everything you can imagine, and it's not just the napkin. Okay, that's just the graphic. And when I teach, um, you know, business to these artists and designers at CCAD, they're visually oriented. They, they love this stuff because I can sit there and bore them to death and talk about a debit and a credit and, and deductions and stuff. 
But when I show it like this on a napkin, right? It's the whole idea when you're sitting at a bar and you go, I've got a great idea. And you do it, next thing you know, it's, it's called PayPal. Well, I didn't have that napkin, but somebody did. So that's one thing we're gonna do is be able to show you that you have, um, you know, incorporating, you can always come back to this and I'll show, I have some examples down the road and these, these uh, PowerPoint um, um, slides will be available down the road too that John can share with everybody, okay? But when you are self-employed, just to let you know, when you're self-employed, you, it's a double-edged sword. You're the boss and you're the employee, you are both. And because of that, when you are incorporated over here, you get a W-2, just like Pittsburgh Glass Center gives you a W-2. Pittsburgh Glass Center splits your, your Social Security and Medicare taxes, okay? Each of you pay 7.65%. So that's a benefit right there that some people don't even know about. But when you are over here, an independent contractor, when you're doing, and it doesn't matter if you're a, single member LLC, you still have to pay self-employment taxes. So the profits at the bottom line is you have the privilege for being your own boss, you have the privilege of paying 15.3% self-employment Medicare taxes. And you have to build that into your pricing. You have to understand bottom line what it is because if you don't, you're gonna get excited about selling something for $300 and you, you sell 10 of those, you go, this is great. And, but when you get done and you pay all your income tax and your self-employment taxes, if you looked at what the dollar amount, what's left and what you had to pay out, you're saying, well, my hourly rate or whatever is like nothing because I'm not really making enough and I should have in, from the beginning, charge more. John found out this, this way too when he did his first big contract, right? He, it, this, this farmhouse thing where he did this, that structure, you know? And in the end, he thought, well, this is great. They're gonna pay me thousands of dollars to do something I can do with my eyes closed. And that all sounds great until the contract said, oh, cost overruns, are the responsibility of the artist. Well, you're going, whoa, 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 you know? Now, John has two brothers that are attorneys. The first thing to do would have been, hey guys, should I sign this? Read it for me. Well, instead, John signed it and then found out, backing into it, that, well, you know, you, now the art of negotiation goes in. And if you can negotiate those things and say, well, look, this thing is way outside the scope of anything that I as an artist change. So that's one of the things you have to walk, be worried about. And then as, a, as an independent contractor or, or just doing it as an artist, if you don't follow through whatever the contract is, and that also predicates the fact that you should have a contract for anything you do other than something that is, a, you know, not, that's not a one-off you do a bunch of times. Like John doesn't have contracts for his, you know, his whiskey glasses, right? Because they're all going out. No one's going to, you know, say, well, look, you know, you didn't make this, the opening big enough for my nose, you know? And so when I drink it, it gets caught. Well, that's, that's buyer beware, right? All right. So this is a very simple way of showing, like on your Schedule C, what is profit, right? What is profit? We hope you have profit because losing money means that you truly, money came out of your pocket. If you lose $8,000 on your Schedule C, well, that's $8,000 had to come from somewhere. So that's not a good thing to have a loss. You might wanna say, well, gee, I'd like to have it, you know, be, be uh, break even. Well, you can do that too, but in the end, you want money from your business to flow into your personal budget. So you take your W-2 from Pittsburgh Glass Center minus all your deductions, your net pay is what goes into your personal budget. And you want that money to be added to your, your profits as, as a independent artist. So what we have here, obviously this is not an, an, an art 
example, but it's the same idea. We have revenue. So let's say that this, this um, artist made $50,000. Cost of goods sold is 20,000. Well, that's a concept a lot of people don't pay attention to because you have inventory. And if you don't sell all your inventory at the end of the year, then it traps some of those costs that you bought your supplies and everything. So uh, in a simple thing, inventory is you start with beginning inventory, like year one to be zero plus any purchases, any supplies, anything, any labor, anything that you, that you had. If you had to have somebody assist and you paid them over the year, $4,000, that's added to cost of goods sold. And then what you do is you subtract out anything that you use for personal items or you gave them away. And then what you do is you subtract your ending inventory. And your ending inventory is based on cost not revenue. It's not based on the value that you're going to sell it for. It's cost. Cost of goods sold, not fair market value of goods sold. So you have to pay attention to that. The idea is try to sell everything by the end of the year, because then all your, all the expenses that you did to make these, you know, glass art or jewelry or anything you made will all show up on your tax return. So what this says is, we've got 30,000 of gross profit. That's just one measure of profitability. That's gross profit. And if you didn't have any other expenses, that's what you would add. You would have to say, well, I have to pay taxes on that. And then what's left over, I get to keep. Well, you're gonna have stuff like SG&A expenses, selling general admin. You know, it's, you might have to hire somebody to do things, right? Like you may have to hire, <clears throat> a bookkeeper. You may have to hire a CPA like me to, to, to do stuff. All that goes in there on SG&A expenses. <laughs> and then you've got depreciation. Now, in today's world, you can pretty much write off expenses. Depreciation means if you pay $7,000 for, an, for a, an item and it's a seven-year useful life, you're going to you're going to depreciate $1,000 a year for that on your tax return. Well, today's world, they want people to, 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 to stay in business. So as an incentive to have people buy machinery and equipment, they let you depreciate um, expense up to like a million dollars. So everything you buy, you can depreciate in the year you buy it. So then you've got operating profit, 18000 and like it says, that's your profit from the core of your business. But if you used a credit card, if you used a credit card to finance a lot of those supplies that went into your cost of goods sold right here, right? Then you're going to have, you may not have enough money to pay it off and you're going to have credit card debt. So in the year, you may have had $1,000 of credit card interest. Interest, not the principal, interest. Or you may have gone, gotten a loan. And if you got a loan, um, then, you know, then you turn around and you say, okay, I'll do that. And, but yet you have interest expense. Bottom line is you pay taxes and then you've got net income of $12,000. Then that 12,000 is what goes into your personal budget. So this is important. You need to be, understand the difference between a tax deduction and a tax credit. And I say that because if you focus on spending just to get a tax deduction, especially at the end of the year, and you spend it on something you don't really need, it's just extra, right? You buy 10 reams of paper instead of three. Well, you buy something like that and it, 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 it doesn't make sense because, um, you don't need it. You're, you're better off if you made a hundred dollars of, of, of profit paying your, let's say it's a 30% tax. You pay, you, you end up after $30 of tax, you have $70 in your pocket. Well, instead, if you spend an extra hundred dollars out of your profit, yeah, you get a deduction 30%. So it net out of pocket only costs you $70. Well, that's a $140 difference economically. 
and on something you don't need, like you buy another computer, you already had one, you say, but I don't want to pay taxes. Pay your taxes, you still have $70 left over you never had. A tax credit is always worth more than a tax deduction, always. Because it's a dollar for dollar reduction of your tax liability. So if you ever have the opportunity, always take advantage of tax credits that are out there because they mean a lot to you. They, that's a dollar for dollar reduction in the tax that you're gonna have to pay. And this just shows you that, you can go back and look at this later, but basically it shows you a $10,000 deduction versus credit. When you get all the way down at the bottom, your total tax with a $10,000 deduction is $10,000. Whereas your net after a $10,000 tax credit is $2,500. That just shows you, you absolutely take advantage of tax credits instead of a tax deduction. All right. So there's a couple special rules for artists. This first one, I call it above the line, which means if you're not itemizing, well, it's really not going to affect too many people because for you guys, you can all just have a Schedule C. But people who don't, and they're employees of two or more employers, well, they can actually take those expenses um, instead of itemizing, they can take them above the line in figuring out your taxable income. Stimulus payments, they're not just for artists, but many artists will qualify. So, um, you know, by now you should have all gotten, or many of you, three <laughs> stimulus payments. You should have gotten a $1,200 one last year, a $600 one at the end of the year or in January, and then another $1,400 one. And that is, that's wonderful because those things are not taxable. They're not taxable at all. Um, and PPP loans are forgivable. That's not taxable either. We had to fight in Congress to get, because the IRS wanted to make these things that you, you, you were either going to be taxed on it or you couldn't take the extra expenses that you use to get the PPP loan forgiven. So this is something I, I, I think I want to spend a few minutes on. I, I just, I think that it's at some point in your career as an artist, it's going to make a, uh, uh, it's going to make a difference. So art festivals and sales tax collection, right? Giant headache. So are you subjected to collecting state sales taxes and remitting them to the state where your festival is? Short answer is yes, you are. But every state has different rules. Every state has different rules. Some states are similar and some states will say, well, you have to treat it like your home state in Pennsylvania as a vendor, you, you sign up and you've got to do your either quarterly or semi-annual sales tax reports. Some states will make you do that. Other states like Ohio, if you came over to Columbus to our art festival that is also again canceled in June for the second year in a row, but it's a good one to come over to. You come over and what you all you have to do is apply for a temporary sales tax vendor license. And then once that festival is over, you file a form and you're done. You remit the taxes. And whereas like um, um, Mississippi has a rule that is kind of crazy, but it's not the only state that has it. Your art festival promoter, whoever is putting the festival on, the artists have to give the information and the money to the promoter, and then the promoter files one sales tax return. It's a nightmare. I just couldn't imagine that happening in, in a state, but Mississippi and about three other states have that. So, um, and, and you, I know they're a pain, but many festivals have state revenue agents prowling around the grounds. They look just like you and me, and they're trying to catch you. They're trying to find out, or they're trying to say, hey, are, are there taxes on this? And you say, oh, no, we don't, you know, but they will catch you. And they can go back three years or more to, to make you pay sales taxes and penalties. 
So this is a good resource. Um, so if you want to take a look at that later when you get um, John emails you these slides, it just tells you where sales tax in the red units, the red dots, that's where you have to file and be a vendor just like you are in Pennsylvania. The blue dots like Pennsylvania and Ohio let you file. Like if I came over to Pennsylvania, I could do a temporary one for one day permit or two days. And everything else is somewhere in between. But I think you'll find this helpful. And um, I have another resource I, I'm gonna give to John that literally, like if you're thinking of traveling to Texas this summer and doing a festival, it has exactly, if there's a link in it, you can go and find out your temporary um, or your permanent vendor license that you need to do. So, and, and so it's a great resource. All right, let's move on to COVID and taxes. This is my only humorous slide that I thought you artists would, would appreciate, right? And I appreciate it, I'm not an artist, but I got this joke right away. I have given this to my other, you know, other CPAs and engineer people and they're going, what? So enough said. So again, we talked about the stimulus checks during COVID. Those are not taxable. They're special rules. If you have not gotten them, and you should have because something went wrong and the IRS didn't have your right address, the check got returned, you didn't have direct deposit information, you can go on the website and you can, you can correct that. And you can also file for your missing stimulus checks on your 2020 tax return. Mm -hmm. If you didn't get it in this year, your $1,400 one, go correct your information so you can get it. Otherwise, you're gonna have to wait till you file your 2021 tax return and apply for the $1,400 stimulus next year. I think everybody would rather have your money now, right? All right, so again, um, Taxes aren't always as hard, but they're 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 not fun, right? Um, I enjoy them, but you know, John loves to blow glass. Maybe if I knew how to blow glass, I would enjoy it. But uh, so we talked about stimulus, the unemployment compensation. If any of you received unemployment compensation in 2020, the IRS is the first ten thousand two hundred dollars you make of unemployment taxes is not taxable. So like I filed John's tax return and this hadn't happened yet. We didn't know about it. So what happens is John, um, what the IRS is going to do in May is they're gonna fix this automatically and then refund John his money. Now that's the IRS saying that and if you believe them, well, okay, but they're supposed to do this. Um, if you had federal taxes withheld on any unemployment benefits, then when you do your tax return, it's treated as just extra money. So the $10,200 will come back to you as extra money. So that's a good thing too. Um, some states will not conform to the IRS non-taxable $10,200. And the PPP loans, if you want to qualify for a PPP loan, and you can qualify, especially under PPP2, even now, even one, because now what they allow you, instead of worrying about your bottom line, like if you had a loss, then you, weren't, you wouldn't qualify. But now they've changed the rules and you can qualify for a loan based on your gross receipts. So if you had gross receipts of $22,000, but only a bottom line profit of Schedule C of 1,000, you weren't gonna get much. But now that they allow you to do it on the $22,000 up front, you're going to get a forgivable PPP loan. They're starting to run out of money. It's it, it only goes till May 31st. But get on get on the horn, talk to your bank, get online, get this done. Okay. So where, when, and how do you file? Right, tax filing days May 17th. If you can't get all your stuff together you can apply for an automatic extension. You don't have to have any reason. It's automatic to October 15th. 
file online and input direct deposit information. Because if you're going to get money back, you can get that money back in three weeks or less if you put direct deposit information in. If you wait and get a paper check, the IRS is saying it could be 12 to 20 weeks before you get issued a paper check. And if you move between now and then, the IRS, when that check comes, and you didn't do it, and if, if your mail is, is not forwarded, it's going to go, or after six months, it will automatically expire. That, that check will go back to the IRS, and you'll have to wait and call the IRS and get them to reissue that check. Okay? So file online. So about now, this is where everybody's feeling. I said, what? I just want to go make jewelry or something. But, you know, it's, it's, the, it's an annual rite of passage, not just in America, in all developed nations. And if you don't like taxes, then you can move to a country that doesn't have taxes, but then you're going to drive on dirt roads and nobody's, when your house catches on fire, no fire trucks are going to come. So pay taxes, pay your fair share and move on. And I know somebody had estimated um, taxes and I'll, I'll wait till we get to our Q&A section on this, but there are some great online resources. If you go to irs.gov, it, it should be your definitive go-to resource instead of Google. Because, you know, you may find stuff, but the answers, if you haven't noticed in Google, might be something like yes, or yes, sometimes, but, you know, and it doesn't really define it. So you don't know if you qualify for whatever the answer on Google is. But I will tell you, I have Google for answers, just to see, is my initial thought right? And then I go look for a real resource. But irs.gov, it's where you go to find out, hey, where's my refund? Um, where's my, uh, um, what happened to my uh, um, stimulus check? You can do all those and you can find all kinds of information on there. It's also where you go to get free filing. Because if you make under $72,000 a year, you can then go in and find a online um, vendor like TurboTax, H&R Block, et cetera, and you can sort of file free. They'll let you file your federal return free, except if you have a Schedule C, it's not free. Then they're going to charge you like $100 or $150 to bump up to the next um, um, package. So it's no longer free. So believe me, you know, if all you have is a W-2, you can file free. But your state won't be free because they'll charge you $50 or $70 or whatever to get your state return file. This napkinfinance.com, it's a great little place because not only does it have the um, visual stuff, but it has a lot of, um, of, of information that, that is drilled down from that napkin. It's a great resource. And you can get professional assistance from a CPA, you know, like me. There's lots of me out there. Well, there's only one of me. There's only one of John. And, uh, and I will say, I am not your traditional CPA. So if you've, if you're, you know, you're not going to get the same person if you go out there. You're there. Most CPAs are a little more conservative and they have short hair and, you know, and they're, they're very focused. Well, you know, I'm a lot like John. Well, I should say John's a lot like me. So if you like John, you'll like my kind of CPA work. And then again, Google searching, right? So we're at that end. And, you know, I'm saying thank you to Pittsburgh Glass Center and all the artists that participated. And, uh, and as you see, this is this, this Rudolph, which you remember from the, the December uh, pot jam. Um, I am, I live for Rudolph and all things Rudolph. And um, it's my favorite time of the year. So when this thing came on, it was like, <laughs> I couldn't, I just couldn't, I was so excited about it. And uh, so it's now going to find a, a well-deserved and wonderful home in Ohio. So I put my contact information out there. Uh, we'll do Q&A stuff, but if you have any questions, you know, feel free to text me or, or um, 
Um, email me at my, uh, it's just my name, CPA at gmail.com. And I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jim. Um, dad, daddy. Uh, that was awesome. I hope that uh, helped for at least, you know, a general overview on stuff. Um, so I do, uh, we do have a bunch of questions. Some of them I think you covered pretty, uh, you know, fluidly throughout the thing, uh, such as LLC versus sole proprietorships and what are the benefits and when should I do like file for one. So I think we're going to skip that one for right now. Okay. Um, the one of the main one I got a lot of questions on are art donations um, and deducting what can you deduct um, if you donate, let's say, your piece to the Pittsburgh Glass Center for our art and fire auction? Uh, what is deductible from that? Is it the value? Is it the make the cost of making? What about paying for assistance? Which line is that? Yeah, well, it's deductible? not the it's it's in a nutshell, it's not the answer you want it to be, right? I mean, you pull some number out of the air, it's like this vase is four thousand dollars you know and you'd like to be able to deduct four thousand dollars but the the way the irs rules are it's it's essentially the cost of what what you know it comes out of inventory essentially so and and so you know one of the things you know is you know how much and that may also be that you did a special thing and you paid somebody five hundred dollars and you spent another $200 on materials and studio time, you've got $1,000 in it, right? That's your deduction. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I think that uh, is a question that comes up every year. I mean, we get that question every year uh, now, here as well. So I will say this. Let's say I buy that vase at auction and I pay $4,000 for it. If I turn around and donate that vase to somebody, to the museum or Thomas Worthington High School, right? I get a $4,000 deduction for it because it's what I paid for it. I paid $4,000. When you made it, you spent $1,000. That's, it's, it should be fair, right? Because we're both out the same amount of money. Yeah. That, that, I'm not saying my money, but we're both out what we put up for it. It's, it's a weird technicality on it, but yes, it does. It makes sense and just unfortunately for the artist gets a little bit shafted a little bit there. Uh, yeah, now <laughs> once you're once you become established, if you're a painter, I mean, you can go and have a um, um, like like artwork, like paintings, right? Those, you know, it, it's hard to say, well, yeah, if I paid a thousand dollars for a piece of art, uh, you know, a painting, but now, you know, Susie is a famous painter now five years later, and then I donate it, then I can get it appraised because the appraiser is going to go online and see that Susie has a bunch of stuff and she's well known. So even though I only paid a thousand for it, I can then have an appraisal done and it says now it's worth $8,000 and that's what I get to deduct it on five years from now. Awesome. All right. Um, uh, you also covered the out-of-state tax. There's a couple of questions about that. Um, so I refer back to the uh, that slide on that uh, for all that stuff. Um, one of the other questions was estimating quarterly taxes. And should that be based off of your previous years as in uh, for, let's say if you're doing quarterly estimated taxes for 2021's uh, fiscal year this year, should you be basing that off of the entire 2020 year or should you be basing off of quarter one of 2021? Well, the IRS has these rules that are called safe harbor, okay? So, so because you, you, what you don't want to do is be wrong and then have a penalty on top because you're going to pay a penalty and interest and the tax. So, basically, the rule is, the basic safe harbor rule is you pay 100% of the prior year or 90% of the current year tax. So, if your current year is going to be a whole lot higher than the prior year, you're you're better off paying in 100% of the prior year because that was lower, right? So if you made $50,000 the prior year and your tax on that was $12,000, you want to pay in $12,000. You don't want to, if you made double, 
made 100,000, you don't want to pay in the tax on making 100,000 because that would be 24,000. You still owe it, but you don't have to pay it until April. Even though you extend your return, well, this year is different. This year you could pay it on May 17th, but in general, there's no extension for paying. You got to pay the piper when it's due. And if you make over 150,000, then you have the luxury of paying in 110% of the prior year or 90% of the current year. But it takes some, that's why I have a job because most people are not able to do it with accuracy. So I have software, right? And, and I look at your tax return and I go, okay, let's figure this out. What's your safe harbor payment? And then set it up. I think that's a great lead into the next question here as well. Uh, kind of lumped a couple of them together is average cost to talk to someone like you, a CPA, um, and also is something like that deductible on your Schedule C or your LLC? Uh, I forget the form number of that because I'm not a tax guy. So, um, yeah. So, you know, average-ish cost to like sit down and have just a meeting with a either tax professional or financial planner or something like business associate. Um, average cost-ish on that. I know it varies all over the place. Right. Um, but then also like, is that a line item that you can then uh, deduct on tax? Yeah, that is a deductible expense. So it would go in just like if you had rent and, you know, you can also take um, a home office expense for your, your separate business, not for PPC or for PGC, but for, um, for your, your artist work. And you can, if you have a dedicated space, you know, in your house um, and you like John and Dana have their third bedroom and it's their studio. And so it is, it, it gets a deduction for that. And that would be one of the other expenses for Schedule C. And so whatever you pay in legal and legal and CPA um, fees would all be deductible. Now, if you use like H&R Block or uh, Liberty Tax Services, you see different things, they're not tax planners. They're, they're, they are trained to just take the data you give them. They're not even gonna ask questions. They will just believe everything you give them and produce a return for you. So they're not gonna, throughout the year, they're not gonna really help you figure things out. So you're not, you know, if you wanna actually sit down and talk with somebody, that's when hiring a CPA and, and most CPAs to start with, um, like I don't charge anybody just to have an initial meeting, just like most attorneys wouldn't either. They gotta figure out what your problem is and find out, hey, is this something that I can, sort of, you know, you know, you know, teach, teach a, uh, teach a person to fish, right? Then they can have fish all their life. Or, I know it's one of those things, but anyway, um, you can do tax returns all your life, right? If you know how to do it. But believe me, I have very smart people who are my clients. And the last thing they want to do is absolutely never do their taxes again. It's enough for them to just gather all the information. So, but you'll find that uh, uh, a, uh, a, a, tax, um, a tax CPA will be happy to sit down and meet with you. And then they'll quote you if they'll say, hey, this is what you want. This is what it would be to, number one, prepare your taxes, right? Because your taxes are sort of like the final exam on a course. You know, you should, it shouldn't be a surprise. You should know what's in it. Because good tax planning, you can't do tax planning right now for 2020. It's over. I can help people out for 2021, a new client, but I can't do anything for you for last year other than maybe recommend that you do an IRA because you have till May 15th to do an IRA or a SEP IRA you have all the way until your extended due date of your tax return. So little things like that you can do. And like, so how, how much ish averaging, like, is there a range that like for someone making, you know, 50 to $75,000 a year, like, is there a you know, of like cost that, you know, we would pay into a CPA? Right. You know, I think if you sort of think in terms of like annually for doing a tax return and, and um, doing planning, it's going to be probably somewhere between, you know, it might be 500 to 750, but you're going to get that as a deduction. So if you spend $500 and you're in the 30% state and federal bracket, right? 
30% of 500 is 15, right? 150. So it's only going to cost you out of pocket 350. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So I, I'm going to try to lump a couple of these questions together. Um, just kind of, you know, getting close to the seven here. Um, so tax credits and tax deductions, uh, two different things. There's, you know, different categories. It seems like there's a lot more deductions that are available than tax credits. Uh, for one example is the child tax credit um, for the new uh, stimulus package uh, that. So for instance, if a parent is divorced um, and the parent who makes the most money claims the child on their taxes, does the $300 go as a month, month tax credit only apply to the parent who claims the child on their tax return? And what are some other tax credits versus deductions and stuff like that. Right. Now, stuff like that, that's why you hire an attorney when you get divorced instead of saying, hey, we can do this for $25 filing fee at the county courthouse. Well, you know, it's all that stuff happens later. You're going, oh, man, I, I got hosed on this. I, you know, you need to have this stuff kind of written out in the divorce agreement that says, and, and for taking care, a lot of times what people will do is even though one person is really supporting paying more than half the the living expenses of the child because that's normally how it goes for who gets the dependent who pays for 51 percent of that child's expenses and it 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 may be that the custodial parent is not the person that's making a lot of money so and what happened if you're not doing it right then you're going to find that the custodial parent is the one that got the deduction and you paid all the money. So you have to work that out with the attorney. But generally what you do is um, they, they make it so that if you have a child, you flip it every other year, that one, one person, the ex-spouse takes it the next year. Okay. And that, and we've upped these credits. So before it wasn't worth so much, right? Well, now it's worth with $4,000, you're starting to talk real money. Um, can you give some examples of some other tax credits versus deductions? Well, Just you know, there is a credit for dependent care credit. Like if you have a child and, you know, one of the things that, um, that you, parents don't think about when they bring this little bundle of joy home, is all of a sudden you've got two working parents. And then when it's time to go back to work, you've got to have somebody take care of, of your, your baby, either in-house or you drop them off somewhere, right? Well, if you drop them off at kinder care, those expenses add up really quickly. And you don't get, you may be out $8,000 or more for that child for child care expenses, but you don't get the full amount. I think it's um, six thousand dollars, Kim. You can tell me if that's right or not. But I think it's six thousand is what you, what your maximum is, no matter how much. And I have some clients out in California that pay like upwards of twelve, fourteen thousand dollars per child for childcare, and that's after tax dollars. So that's a that's a tax credit that is really a very helpful one. There are things like if you own a home, right, you might want to put up solar panels. And so you get a credit on your taxes for putting up solar panels. And you don't have to have a, a giant array up there. You could just say, look, I, I just want it to, to um, you know, uh, fill up um, one panel or two panels. And, and the cost isn't that isn't that expensive, but you get a nice hefty, uh, used to be, uh, used to get 35%. I think it's down now. To, it's been going down. I think it's down to 27% now. And in a couple of years, it's going to go down to a permanent 21%. Perfect. Um, so we're going to try to wrap up here in the next five-ish minutes. I mean, we might run over just a little bit, um, but a couple, a couple more questions. Um, PVP loan, if you could talk real quickly about that on where, what you should do, where you should go to look at um, if your business or yourself qualifies for that. Um, I will say I did get my PVP loan funded today. Um, 
it is kind of a pain, but it's really not that bad. Um, it, it, it really is not. Uh, so that's something that I can also like give you my experience on that also later. Um, but then also, um, actually, you just want to talk about that first and then we'll. Okay. Well, you know, it, it's free money. You may have seen that commercial on TV for one of the free tax services, right? Free, 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 you know? And they're really only talking about the federal, maybe. But anyway, it truly is free. As long as you know going in that you qualified, that you had at least one quarter that was a like 20%, 20, 25% dip from 19, which is easy to for everybody to, to, to prove. Um, you can qualify. And like I said, now it used to be that when they first started out, it was just your bottom line. And when it first came out, you know, if you had a loss, you, your SOL, you could not get a PPP loan. They changed the rules. Now it's on gross receipts. So, and basically it's, if you take, um, let's say you had um, $30,000, uh, of gross receipts in your in your art um, business, you take that number divided by twelve, which is twenty five hundred times two and a half. You get a six thousand two hundred fifty dollar PPP loan, free money. Why yeah. wouldn't you? Now you go to check uh, your, your eligibility and uh, what how how do you go about actually yeah. starting that process? Right, so. You can go to the SBA, sba.gov, lots of great resources there to find out if you qualify. It's a great right? resource. So go to that now. Then you can't just apply for it on your own. They put a middle person in there called the bank, right? Because the bank is, it's a service of the SBA administered by your local bank. And you can't do it unless you have a business relationship. Now, banks will let you open up a, a business checking account. What some of you, I'm sure, are doing is commingling your funds. You've got one checking account. You run everything through it. The IRS doesn't like that. Banks don't like that. You really ought to always have your own checking checkbook for your business. Do not commingle those. Keep your business here and your personal here. Have an account for each. And... You can, you go on their website and if, if it's Chase, you go, you go on Chase and there's a, uh, you click on, and it'll say interested in PPP loan or it's called EIDL, Economic Injury Disaster Loan. That's another one you can do, but you get, that's not forgiven. You got to pay that back. So. Not free. Um, not I want to wrap up with, uh, I think, uh, Two quick questions and then kind of a final thoughts thing. Uh, the first thing is, uh, there's a question on here that someone had been told that from a consignment shop that PA sales tax does not apply to works of art. Is this true? Um, I'm gonna say no, but um, it, I, I know it does depend on certain places, yeah. But. No, I mean like medical, like if you, if you go to the pharmacy and you get a prescription filled, there's no taxes on that. Yeah, And now there might be something, and I do not know because each, like I said, every state is different. Ohio might, might have a completely different thing on works of art. And a work of art also might be something that has to be, you know, there's a list of how do you qualify to be a work of art. You know, if I, if I have a white canvas and I put one red dot in the middle, is that a work of art? Well, if I'm Picasso, it is a work of art. It's worth $5 million. Man, we could go on for a long time on that one on what is art. Um, yeah, what but, is art? So yeah. basically check with your, with your local tax uh, yep. code in your city and state. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Um, one more thing, um, paying yourself through a partnership LLC, uh, is it best to write just a check to yourself or deposit money? How, how to go about actually paying yourself through either a partnership or a, sole, a single member LLC? Okay. Here's very important. You have to understand if you're a sole proprietor, a single member LLC or a partnership, you do not pay yourself because whatever's left over is yours. Okay. Okay. So if you are in a multi, multiple member LLC, you know, like that, then, you know, same, same thing. But if you're in an S corp, you have to pay yourself as an officer of the company. 
And, and that's why S corps are hard and, and C corps too. So you, you, you don't pay yourself. You, what you pay yourself is what you have left over minus your taxes. That's yours. That makes sense. Awesome. Um, and then I guess to wrap it up here, since it is seven o'clock, uh, do you have any words of wisdom uh, for people like us that have no idea what next month is going to be like? And we're like, oh, I just like yesterday I made, you know, like 50 new, uh, you know, products to sell out. But like, I don't know if I'm going to sell these things or not. Like, I hope they do. But, you know, as, as far as like any words of advice on like how to run a business like this, because it's, as you know, from knowing me, uh, it's difficult sometimes. Right. Well, and, you know, it's, it's important to know that the longer you're in business doing what you're doing, you know, I mean, I tell my art students, you know, I tell them, I said, look, the sad fact is five years from now, only 15% of you are going to be doing anything relating to art to be compensated. The rest of you, because you either hated math and you didn't want to do it, or they pay somebody to do everything and they don't have any money left over. So, you know, once you have a little track record and you know that you've got stuff and you can say, look, I'm going to have a base amount. You can always adjust your quarterly estimates. You don't even have to do estimates if you don't want. You could take your salary from Pittsburgh Glass Center or anywhere else you work and adjust those withholdings. So you take more out than you normally should have, but then that's nice because especially at the end of the year and you screwed up and you could say, oh, you know what? My December check, I'm gonna have to have all go to withholdings and it's it's done all the way to the back beginning of the year it's treated equally over the whole 12 months so you can adjust as you go along so every time and your estimated payments in a normal year our first one is april 15th second one's june 15th the next one's september 15th and the last one is january 15th and you can change and look at your estimates every time I mean, that's one of the things that I do as a CPA in November, right? I'm, I'm looking at everybody's projections and saying, hey, you're going to owe a bunch of money in January. So start saving for it. Or if something happens in your life that you get a, a bonus or something that, you know, make sure that you have the right amount of taxes taken out of it, not just the little uh, smallest, because I have some people already, um, John, like Eric, you know, yeah. um, he did not have anything taken out of his unemployment compensation. He gets $26,000 and he took nothing out of it. And the best thing in the world that happened was this 10,200 because that really helped him. And because otherwise, yeah. where was he going to get? He was like, where am I going to get the money? Because he already spent it, right? Yeah. So always... Always err on the side of having taxes taken out when you can. You'll be happier, be a much happier camper at the end of the year. Pay your taxes. It's a good thing to pay your taxes. Um, well, um, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to post this re recording and everything on our YouTube channel. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, and again, uh, Jim's contact information will also be on that slide. I'm going to email everyone and try to do a nice little sum up on everything. Um, and if you have more really direct questions, uh, you know, you feel free to email him as well. And uh, those resources that he posted on there are actually, they're fantastic. They're really dry, except for the napkin finances is not. <laughs> uh, but like the SBA site, that's, oh, it's terrible, but it's really good information. Yeah. So I, I can't stress it enough. Just go and spend, you know, an afternoon with a beer and read through it all. Cause it's, it's there. All the information is there. Um, the IRS.gov is great. SBA.gov is great. Um, so take a look. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming and I hope you guys have a good rest of your week. Thanks guys. You're welcome. Let's do this again next year. Sounds great. All right. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Awesome. <laughs>